I retired in uh, March of 1979, 50 years of age. Now you know how old I am. And I had five more years to serve. I decided I'd get out then. Also, Attorney General Griffin Bell and the later uh, Attorney General Ben Civiletti under uh, Carter asked me to coordinate security for the Pan American Games, so I retired uh, early in order to coordinate the games in San Juan, Puerto Rico in the summer of 1979. So what they did with this law, they got rid of the loyal, dedicated Hooverites, true, but we did not have one instance of corruption during our tenure. The FBI had an impeccable record. We were admired and respected. And if we received a complaint on a case, whether we liked it or not, we investigated it. We had 164 categories which we investigated. And if it came in and fell within one of those 164 categories, we investigated it. We didn't put it in a wastebasket. We didn't throw it away. We didn't disregard it. Now what you have is what I call selective prosecution. And it takes on regularly. It, it occurs regularly. I know because I've been a victim of it. There were attempts uh, in the early 1980s, by the way, to set me up on a fraud case. I uh, did not commit fraud, so they were unsuccessful there, the FBI. They attempted to set me up on a drug case in 1982. I was successful there because I would never be involved in anything of that nature. And the person who was liaisoning with the FBI and trying to set me up was a girl named Pam Fawcett. After six months, she came to me and told me that she had the run of the FBI Modesto, California office. The FBI had given her $2,000. She even had her own coffee cup, and she could run, come and go as she pleased. But I helped her out uh, on a couple of occasions because she had a young son, a young uh, teenage son, 14 years old as I recall, who had some problems and I gave her some fatherly advice. She didn't have a husband or a boyfriend. And when she came to me, she drove to, to Los Angeles. We met in the parking lot and she told me the story how she was set up on drugs and uh, they told her that if you want to uh, get out of this charge, these drug charges, you have to work with us against Ted Gunderson. And uh, she said also that um, she gave me the notes of one of the telephone conversations we had where the agent wrote out the instructions on what she should ask of me on the telephone. I have these notes, by the way, in a safety deposit box. That's how I knew she was telling the truth. So I said to Pam, I said, well, Pam, why did you come over to my side? And you've been working with these people for six months. Why did you come over to my side? She said, well, I woke up the other morning and I realized you're the only honest, these are exact words, you're the only honest son of a bitch I've talked to in the last six months. That is the truth, folks. The last time I heard from Pam, she told me she was on a hit list. She had to go into hiding. I haven't heard from her since. This was 20-some uh, years ago. So <clears throat> now, uh, by the way, after that, there were several attempts on my life. There were occasions, several occasions, when gunmen were waiting for me at certain locations. I didn't go. I say through divine intervention. I didn't know they were there, but I was able to avoid that. And most recently, uh, because I've become fairly well known, I guess, because I shoot my mouth off and I tell it like it is, I'm the victim of a disinformation program. There, there are a number of people out there who are spreading disinformation on the internet about me that are absolute lies and false allegations. For example, Stu Webb, who I happen to know is an FBI informant, and I have documentation of this because I took him in once. He said he, had to, he needed a place to stay for four days. I said, well, come on in. He stayed for seven months. When I asked him to leave, he stole me. He stole all kinds of products from me. I'll have to say I had all kinds of products that were missing, my research. I had books that were missing and so forth, so he's the only one that could have taken them. And um, I happened to know that when he left, there was a memo that he had written to the uh, Las Vegas Police Department. In his memo, he stated that he was in, uh, working with the FBI at that time. I have a copy of that memo. And also, he was interviewed uh, on an interview on a videotape. And in the interview, 23 minutes into the tape, he stated that uh, he was also uh, uh, working for the FBI, and he had a symbol number. Symbol numbers are given to informants. They're not given to people walking the streets. Now, I was reviewing this tape on my couch with uh, my uh, roommate uh, after I received it, because I told that he was bad-mouthing me. I was told that. And when I heard him say this, I was shocked. So I set the tape aside, 
And about a week or ten days later, I made copies and distributed it to some people around the country. And a man in North Carolina called me and said, there's nothing on there about him working with the FBI and being given a symbol number. So I pulled the tape and played it, and it was not there. Now, the only way that could have not been there is because somebody came in and switched it. Now, there was a period, October the 3rd, when I was out of way and my roommate was gone from my condominium for about three hours. Somebody had to come in and put another tape there. You would not know that from playing it because it was exact duplicate as far as the cover was concerned. So now we have burglary, we have attempted murder, we have attempts to frame me, and I'm not belly aching or complaining because this goes with the, the territory. I'm not a whistleblower because I'm not talking about the FBI when I was in. I'm talking about the FBI now that I'm out. What do we have? What do we have since I left? We have agents within the ranks who are spies and been convicted of spying. We had Richard Miller in the FBI Los Angeles Division who was working with the Soviets. We had Robert Hansen, Washington, D.C., headquarters agent, who had access to extreme sensitive information. And as a matter of fact, uh, Hansen is reported to have given the Promise software to the Soviets. And Bin Laden is supposed to have the Promise software now, so he can keep track of what we come up with in connection with his investigation by the FBI here locally. And most recently, we have James J. Smith, uh, the agent on the uh, West Coast, who was involved with a Katrina Lung, L-E-U-N-G, a Chinese lady, in the ranks. And then in Boston, we had a fellow named John Connolly, who was working with the mob, as, as he had infiltrated the mob. And he had knowledge about contract killings about Whitey, involving Whitey Bulger and other individuals. So we have a corrupted FBI now. The FBI, again, selective prosecution by the U.S. Attorney, cover up of major investigations, uh, and they're, they're basically uh, looking the other way. They're, they're being used as puppets, absolute puppets. This is an article here. This is an article here that I have on... Uh, on Mr. Smith, James J. Smith, FBI agent. This is in the uh, Washington Post, and it's dated June 20th, 2003. If you want to take a look at that for documentation. I'm sure you probably read it already in the paper. And here's, uh, again, an article. This is in the uh, Washington Post again, June the 20th, 2003. That was a pretty good, uh, pretty good issue uh, that day about the Whitey, Whitey Bulger and uh, Mr. Conley of the FBI involved in contract killings. Okay, so where do we go from here, folks? Well, we have a problem. We have a serious problem. By the way, let me mention this. The Franklin cover-up documents, the child kidnapping operation out of the Washington, D.C. area and out of Nebraska. The, the, again, back up for the finders. Uh, I have a book here by Noreen Gosh. Noreen Gosh's book is uh, Why Johnny Can't Come Home. And this is a story about a 12-year-old newspaper boy, Johnny Gosh, who was kidnapped back in the early 1980s. And uh, Noreen Gosh, the mother, wrote this book. Johnny was kidnapped by this network I'm telling you about, the finders, slash FBI Franklin cover-up and used as a sex toy. He and another boy later stole a car and escaped, and they've been in hiding ever since. They were in hiding on an Indian reservation at one time, and they were, uh, they had to leave because 2020 came out to do a story on this Franklin cover-up case. By the way, it was killed when Disney bought out uh, 2020. But Karen Burns, the uh, producer, I spent five days with her, gave her my research and my, infor excuse me, my information. But she went up, she found out where, jo where Johnny was hiding and went up there and uh, he had to leave. So I don't know where Johnny is today, but I understand he's still alive. I hope he stays and is able to continue to live.